I will start by telling you a story which is supposed to tell you what culture is in a sort of indirect way. Because if, if I immediately start with the science, it might be a bit heavy. And we all have culture. Culture is the unwritten rules of the social game by which we play. Every group has its dialect. Christianians definitely have a dialect of the Danish culture. Um, but uh, talking about it is more difficult than just doing it. We can all do culture, but not all of us can talk about it, and you can actually very easily talk and misunderstand. So a story first, then I will go into the science. This is a story that was created by a Dutch... Uh, if anything goes wrong with the sound... <laughs> what's happening? Uh, thingy. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with my thingy? <laughs> ah, did I touch something? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, so this was created more than 50 years ago by a Dutch author, Martin Tonder. And I think he was prophetic in many of the cartoons that he made. So here we see uh, the castle and home of Heer Bommel, who is a gentleman, and we'll see him here. This is Heer Bommel. And as you can see, he's a gentleman who really believes himself to be something. Uh, he has a little friend, it's Stompush, and uh, he is visited one day by a uh, trots. Who, that's a creature, uh, a very foreign creature, and uh, that creature asks him for help, believing him to be an important professor. You know, sometimes people believe that somebody else is an important professor, and they start to act strange. Anyway, this happens to Herr Bommel, who isn't a professor at all, but he's glad to go along with the story. So, um, he's very flattered, but he believes himself to be above traveling to the faraway island of the Trots, where there is a bad problem. As Travelin Trots, the Trots explains, a monster is devastating their island. And uh, it's a peaceful island. They uh, sail the seas and they trade, much like certain northern European countries, but they are devastated by this monster. Tompus tells Herbomo, uh, I'm going to the island, I'm going to sail because Captain Valrus is sailing, are you coming with me? No, this is not for me, I'm a gentleman, he says. And then uh, the real professor arrives, you can recognize this gentleman immediately as Professor Prlwitzkowski, uh, and this is the manservant of Herr Bommel. and suddenly uh, Traveline Trotz starts to laugh his head off. Uh, what's so funny, why are you laughing? You guys are so much alike, he says. I like this. You know, I can distinguish them, but of course, if you're a foreigner, you don't. Foreigners are all so alike. These Europeans are so alike if you're not from here. Anyway, uh, we are going to follow now Tompus, who follows the captain, to the island of the Trots. To me, they look a lot alike, but they can actually tell one another apart very well. It's a peaceful island, as said, and uh, they trade in nuts that they then uh, sell to the captain who sells it all around the world. But their culture is a bit different from the home culture, and Hebommel, who f finally uh, followed Tompus in an airplane also to go to the island to help the uh, trots against the monster, uh, quickly uh, starts a dispute because he has his own opinion about something and the trots try to explain to him that the majority are always right. So this is the special thing about this island. Uh, they're not backward at all, they're ahead because the majority are always right. And you're just alone and we are the majority and we are right, is what they are saying to him. Then Captain Walrus has his own means of resolving this little dispute, as you can see. And then he asks the constable, you can see the constable, I can recognize him because of the medal, otherwise he looks very much like the others. Uh, who's right now? And the constable uh, says, yes, of course, uh, uh, Hebommel did nothing wrong, and you're right, because the majority has been dis dispersed. But uh, the constable adds, I have a premonition, something really bad's going to happen, and uh, uh, we have to do something. And what's going to happen? I can feel the monster approaching. So yes, all the trots, uh, dive into holes made specially for that purpose in order to hide for the approaching monster. 
the monster mob trotter. And soon, they're still here. There, in the distance, you can see the monster arriving from a certain cave in the mountainside. So they go into hiding, and Tompus remembers the saying, everything changes, but the monster roams eternally. Here it is, the monster, and actually it, la it lays to waste the city of the trots. Uh, as you can see, everything's demolished. They go back to the city, and Tompus hears some crying, and he finds this lonely little trot, uh, Smores is the name, who is crying, and what's the matter, says Tompus, sits close to him and asks him, and he says, I don't have a premonition, I'm different from the rest, I don't hear when the monster comes, and uh, so that's why he's all alone there crying. And then uh, Tompus follows him back to the city of the trots, uh, when uh, Tompus says, oh, this is so bad, the monster, I uh, can see that you need help against the monster. Oh, says Smores, the monster is not so bad. We can rebuild this. We have many hands. We are always together. We can do so much work. It's not belonging that's so bad. That's the only thing worrying him. Tompus decides that uh, he has to find out about this monster. And he has seen whence it came. It came from this cave in the mountain. So he's going to look in the mountain, in the cave, although it's forbidden. Entrance is forbidden, and some trots are getting excited about Tompus entering the forbidden cave. Uh, this is knowledge, of course, this forbidden cave. You see that there's a big, uh, there's a, a great symbolism in this story. Anyway, he enters the cave and notices that there are these holes in the floor of the cave. Maybe it rings a bell to those of you who have seen more of these stories. Anyway. Meanwhile, Travelain, our first trot, whom you may recognize because he, he has these uh, pouches on his cheeks, has found the real evil professor Sigbok and purchases a bomb from him. A bomb guaranteed to uh, blow the monster up. Because he is actually the boss of the nut trade, so for him the monster is a big problem because it, it's bad for the commerce of the island. So he goes back to the island, here he is carrying the bomb in uh, a bag. And uh, Captain, sure enough, uh, sails to and fro uh, the island. Now I'm, I'm jumping a bit because it's a long story. And we're back when the uh, bomb is on the island. And uh, Travelaine has given it to Herr Bommel, who at the Moment Supreme was uh, freaked out by the bomb and gave it to Tompus, who tried to throw it in the sea uh, to... Um, uh, keep it from doing any damage, where it explodes and throws a huge wave onto the land at the very moment when the monster is striking again. And of course you can see what happens now. The monster actually consists of little trots. And now they all wake up and they found out that, uh, what is this? And uh, We are the monster. We are the monster. Here is Smores the Trot wanting to fight the monster because he didn't have the premonition, but he could see that everybody was gone. But of course, he sees that the monster is already dispersed. And now the Trots have found out what the monster was. They can do something against it. And this is actually what we see in the last image of this story. Here we see Smores the Trot. He is manning a water hose. So he can, whenever the monster strikes, he can uh, pour water over it to wake it up. And here you see the Trot happily uh, charging nuts onto the boat. So it's really a happy end. So this is the end of the story. But what is the moral of this story? What does it teach us? Exactly, we are the monster. We are the blind monster also of culture. And it's true. So if you talk about evolution of culture, then it's very hard for us to see because it evolves in ways that we don't really know. It's a bit like the climate. There's a lot of dispute about whether the climate is actually evolving or not. Is it evolving? Is it getting warmer? Well, some people say yes, other people say no. And it's difficult to say, but your grandparents will be able to say whether it has evolved since their childhood, for sure, if their memories are not distorted by happiness or bad luck. So change in culture is slow. It actually happens across the generation. So it's very difficult to say whether a culture evolves, and certainly difficult to steer it. So we'll talk about that some more later. So yes. 
We ourselves form the blind monster of culture. And we need outsiders such as the Trots uh, Smores or Tompus, who's basically only brains and nothing else. Uh, Herr Bommel is a lot of vanity, but Tompus is brains. We need outsiders who can tell us who we are. Uh, as, as you can see a mountain better from far away. If you're on it, you don't see it anymore. And also there are a few little letters, like uh, lessons like strangers look alike, always. So we are programmed to see them as members of an amorphous group. We are programmed to see our own people as all different. Meals matter too, is also an important lesson. Every story worth uh, its salt finishes with a meal. At least that's the case for the stories of Hibomo. Here we are in the ship and we have a modest meal. The professor is trying to explain the theory about the monster, but nobody's really listening. Uh, Hebommel is saying some really stupid things, but he's more charming, so people are listening to him. Also another lesson. Okay, so this is the story about the blind monster of culture. I have a meta story. I'm a professor too, or I pretend to be one. And I took this from Theodore Kemper, who's really a very old sociologist. He's in his late 80s now, but really worth reading. This is a book he wrote four years ago, Status, Power and Ritual Interaction. A relational reading of Durkheim, Goffman and Collins. And if you know about sociology, these are some gurus, semi-gods of sociology. And he says, you guys have some really good points, but I have better points. And I think he's convincing. He integrates their thinking. And what he says is basically social life is all about conferring status on others and uh, getting status back. So, for instance, I will try to confer status upon you, the audience, by giving you a really good lecture, and you confer status on me by all looking at me and listening to me, which is a great conferral of status. And people do it freely to those who are deserving. If you love somebody, you really want to sh shower them with presence and with love. That is a need. So we are not here for greed. We are here for conferral of status onto the worthy. And societies differ in what they consider to be worthy of status conferral. Here, for instance, Smores immediately feels better when somebody sits and listens and says, what's the matter to you? Comforting is a conferral of status. Here, uh, uh, Herr Bommel is claiming too much status. And they are all angry with him for claiming too much. Envy and, and that kind of feeling is uh, an emotion that you frequently have in egalitarian societies. And here we see use of power. The captain is not going to take any of that shit. He just beats the hell out of them and that settles it. But typically power use creates resentment. It's, it's fortunate for the captain that the trots are not at all resentful. Most peoples, if an invader did this to them, would definitely want to retaliate. So this is basically the theory of Kemper in a few examples from the stories. What I haven't uh, said so much about is that intergroup rules are very problematic. What do you do to be worthy of status? For instance, I dressed up a bit uh, for today. Maybe I'm overdressed now here. And by the way, I am because it's getting hot. Uh, but, and I think I, I, can, I can actually take it off. I will do so later. Okay, so let's um, leave our uh, now happy island of the trots. Maybe it's a bit boring without the monster, but they will find out soon enough. And go to part two. This is about... Um, I'm also a researcher in a computer science department where I am sort of the social scientist for some projects. And this is a project where we made cross-cultural training software with the idea that many, many uh, young people in Europe uh, travel between countries, uh, certainly for their first job, but often also for fun or just for personal growth. And it might be good for them to have some training uh, that they can take on their smartphones at home, such as this. So you have this virtual environment in which you stand in front of a, a connect 
And now I can, for instance, uh, make different gestures to indicate my emotions or what I'm going to say to the other. It's difficult to make a system uh, that recognizes a full natural speech, but uh, this system uh, with the Xbox can work. I can demonstrate it in the corner back there after the lecture. I was trying to do it here, but the light isn't so good, so I, I figured that it might actually be a waste of time and not really work, because you'd need also these big shining lights that would then blind everybody. So even if the light was good, nobody would see it. So we'll do it in the corner afterwards. So then you see uh, what the, your taxpayer money is being spent on, among others. Okay, doke. So uh, that the, the, the me person uh, in the episode that I would like to concentrate on uh, has to find a hotel. And of course, if you want to find a hotel, you have to be nice to people. But how are you going to be nice to people in a faraway place if you don't know the unwritten rules? It's difficult. Okay, so uh, if you are going to try the system, you have to try to confer status appropriately. Not more, because if you confer too much status on somebody, they might think something's up. Uh, if you're too nice, then they start to suspect you of having ulterior motives, which is probably true. If you're not nice enough, they will become angry. Flattery usually works. Okay, and if you want to try out for yourself, you can find it here. Right. So this was supposed to be the demo of the traveler. And now after the demo, we go to the serious business. Debriefing of the traveler, um, I think I'll leave this and go to the unwritten rules of the social landscape. So this is culture. So social landscape. I have here a few landscapes that have a very different atmosphere. Uh, here we have a uh, Dutchish landscape uh, rather outmoded, but you see um, there's the atmosphere of uh, hard work done by these machines and otherwise very cultured landscape. Here it is wild but very peaceable and friendly. Here it is wild and uh, it's a jungle, there don't seem to be any rules. And here it's wild, but if you look more close, you can see that there's a lot of labor and uh, culture actually that has settled itself into the landscape. So let's travel around these different social landscapes for a bit. I bet there are many, many backgrounds and you have all traveled a great deal be uh, between you. So a lot of this is probably going to be recognizable. I have some world maps for you and you can actually choose your, if you can see anything that is, you can choose your favorite parts on the map and have a look at them. I'm, I'm sure these images will be on the web sometime. So those of you who are ill placed, you can see it then. Okay. What is the function of culture to organize society so that people can understand one another? For instance, you all know that if you're listening to a lecture, well, you're supposed to be more or less silent, and then probably there will be a moment for asking questions when some people with big egos can show off, <laughs> uh, or more or less. Actually, the symbolic the value of those, that question asking is itself uh, quite a debatable thing. And uh, maybe it'll be for the betterment of everything. That's a question, of course. Here we have uh, the book. This is my dad, who started the culture work. And this is me, and this is a Bulgarian scientist, Michael Minkov, uh, on culture in which the current state of our knowledge is summarized in six big issues of social life, the dimensions of culture. So the big issues of social life are the issues, the symbolic issues, if you like, that a society has to resolve in order to be a society. You have to know uh, how much independence is there for an individual. You have to know whether people are basically supposed to be equal or basically unequal. I'm here, I'm higher than you. So I, I symbolize uh, an unequal division of roles in this case. Um, and there are societies in which you always look for the unequal and others, like the Danish, where you don't. You look for equality. I've been eating together with the people uh, who run the science and cocktails. This would be very unusual in almost all other countries because they would say, you're an outsider, you're a guest. We'll do something that is fitting for a guest. In this case, the best thing uh, you can offer me as a Dane is to let me be part of the group. Then, uh, aggression, uh, are we uh, from Mars? 
Or are the men from Mars and the women from Venus? Or are we all from the Earth? Then, uh, are there things to be scared of? Is there anxiety and fear in society, like contagious disease, or homosexuals, or uh, foreigners, or, uh, um, I don't know, maybe uh, things from outer space? By the way, this is often very rational. I, I'm sort of laughing it off, but it can be very rational to have, uh, to have anxieties. Um, do we live in a world that's always immutable and the same, or that changes all the time? which has very different requirements on how to confer status, how to be a good member of society. Is life a good place to be? Is life there to be free and to have fun, yes or no? So these are the six basic problems, and I believe, to the best of my knowledge, this is more or less it. At the level of society, though, not at the level of the individual. I'm not talking psychology here. I'm not talking personality. I'm talking functions for society. Oh, God. Uh, Okay, well, at least Costas has something to do tonight. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, here we have a world map for the first dimension, and it's individualism versus collectivism. So this is not the same collectivism that you use in the word collectivity, like Christiania, there's a collectivity, very individualistic. Everybody does their own thing, but in an egalitarian way and in a peaceful way. That's in the other dimensions. So here we see that it's really a bit of the West against the rest. The West is individualistic in culture. It doesn't mean selfish. It means everybody uh, should have their own opinion, their own mind, which is a very good culture if you're a hunter-gatherer culture. You know, if you're gathering in the field, you need to be able to decide yourself and to find your own way to look for the good roots and grubs or animals. So, culture is an adaptation to circumstances, and here we touch a little bit on evolution. It will probably have evolved in such a way that it was functional, otherwise those peoples wouldn't still be there. So you can see uh, the Indian cultures, very collectivistic. These are cultures that resemble the countries from which most of the people immigrated to those countries. African cultures tend to be collectivistic. In the Maghreb, it's more in the middle. You have a very collectivistic China, rather more individualistic Japan. There is a big culture gap here. And you see also it's not very nuanced. For instance, India is almost a continent in itself. It has one color. And it's probably not true if you go look in the field. But okay, this is like a, a coarse climate map of the cultures of the world. So it's not at all detailed enough. I'm sure you know some differences between the different uh, Danish islands in culture. Okay, here we see Europe, very individualistic. Portugal is rather more on the collectivistic side, very collectivistic pockets in uh, Slav countries. Oops. Yes, here we are. The second of the big issues of social life is about hierarchy. And the map is a bit similar, but still not quite the same. In Europe, for instance, we see that, you know, le roi soleil, uh, the French system, is a very much uh, centralistic system. So you see the, 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 the size of Paris and the smallness and the insignificance of the French countryside is also visible in this culture map. It's a very centralized system, inherited, inherited from the Romans. In the north, there is much more of an egalitarian system, the Germanic and Scandinavian system. The Slavs, though, have a very hierarchical culture. But the Hungars, this is the Magyar invasion in the, in the year 1000, they are not Slavs, they are very different. So you see that the European map is very different in different dimensions and very rich. Old uh, parts of the world with, with long-standing civilizations tend to, are very varied, to be very varied in terms of culture. So far, the Scandinavian countries and uh, the, the northwest of Europe are all alike. The third issue was to do with aggression and roles of, uh, the role of genders. And here we see a very different map. For the first time, we see the Netherlands and Denmark and the Scandinavian countries clustering together against the Germanic uh, and Anglo parts of Europe. And this is very visible in interpersonal atmosphere, and the smallest beautiful atmosphere of Christiania in particular, and Denmark in general, which is not at all uh, what you feel in Germany or in England, where big is beautiful, and you have to dress up, and you have to be serious, and playing is maybe not such a good idea for grown-ups, which is a good idea in Denmark. 
So this is about gender roles also. Uh, do you get uh, leave uh, when you have a baby as a father? Is it a good thing to be just as uh, cuddly uh, as a mother, for instance? Or are you a little bit ridiculous when you do that? Can you pee sitting as a man? Or should you pee standing up as a real man? <laughs> uh, this has to do with this dimension. Also, while we're at it, the length of sex. How long do you think that sex lasts, depending on this culture dimension? It depends on the status power game. If you're in a really masculine mindset, this is about proving your uh, merits. And of course, that's going to be virility. And so you will have a brief and violent sexual act. If it's about <laughs> feminine culture, it's about togetherness and conferring lots of status on both sides of the gender gap. Or maybe you're the same gender. I've, I've seen this Swedish film where they said it doesn't really matter whether you're a man or a woman. So the sexual act lasts a lot longer. And actually the performance isn't so important. It's the togetherness. So of course this is, I'm, I'm making really, uh, um, how do you say, opposition where in reality there isn't really opposition. There's gradual difference and I am not talking about interpersonal differences which there are so many of. Now this is the country level thing. But permissiveness, for instance, uh, uh, in terms of sex, is linked to this dimension. Okay, we go now to this one. The fourth one is about the anxiety thing. So this is slightly less straightforward. You need a lot of imagination in order to be scared. And here we see that Europe is actually a rather anxious continent, except for Denmark, uh, Sweden, and uh, the Anglo countries. We are actually a little bit more in the middle, so the Dutch are more anxious and certainly uh, we are now in a phase of fear that has lasted since the attempt, the, uh, the murder of Pim Fortuyn and uh, there have been two, actually uh, Theo van Gogh also, there have been two political murders, everybody's nervous now and uh, we're not in a very happy phase of the country. Although many people individually are quite happy, the, the public uh, let's say the res publica, the public affairs aren't so good. Okay, what do we see here? Again, China, also very light color. Chinese, you can find them everywhere in the world. They are not afraid of something new. They are very respectful of the leader, but they're not afraid of something new. Uh, in the countries that have light colors also, you will find music from all around the world, easily, and food from all around the world. Maybe not very good local food though. That might be better in a, in a country with a darker color. Huh? You have the appellation d'origine contrôlée and it's really uh, guarded and good. <laughs> so every uh, side of a dimension has its good and its not so good points. But of course, uh, it's not about good or bad, it's about a fit with conditions. If you have been in a place in the world with lots of risky stuff happening from all around, you probably will have developed a more uncertainty avoiding culture. And there's also a bit of a Roman Empire effect, I think, in Europe. Roman Empire and Slav. Okay. Then we go to the last two uh, dimensions and uh, they were developed in different research, which is also a lesson of this social scientific research. You can only find what you look for. And if you do questionnaire based research and you don't ask for certain things, you will not find uh, anything about them. And these dimensions were found by factor analyzing, if that means anything to you, uh, questions uh, from questionnaires to find questions that cluster together. And if they cluster together, they probably are about the same thing. And these same four things, we've just had them. And this was found in a study that also included questions uh, invented by Chinese people. And they are very long-term change oriented, if you like. Confucian values are about everything changing, yin and yang, and uh, perpetual movement. That's also uh, associated with wanting to learn and to school yourself and humbleness of the individual. And you can see that on the other side of the spectrum, you have these countries here, that tend to be in more tropical uh, regions, where uh, things are supposed to be immutable and uh, truths especially, and they are, are not changing. People on the good side of the medal will be very uh, liberal in receiving guests because you have to be a good person here and now too. So if you are hosted by people who have cultural roots in the Maghreb, they will probably be very, very good hosts to you. Okay, uh, you see that Europe, this is actually from another study, there are two studies that found the same dimension, which is a very strong thing in social theory. You, 
don't often find that. You can see that in Europe, Denmark is rather long-term oriented, and this is probably the contrast with Sweden that's much more short-term oriented is associated with the more tight rituals in Sweden. If you've been studying in Sweden, you know about the rituals for the fika, and they're pretty circumscribed, they're pretty precise, which I think might be a reason why the Danes tend to sort of uh, feel the Swedes are slightly ridiculous. <laughs> but uh, I should maybe talk with some Danes and Swedes about this tonight. And I'm sure the Swedes have something to say about the Danes too. Again, you see uh, some uh, differences in Central Europe. And of course, there are white countries on all of these maps. And uh, I didn't tell you, but that means there are no data or I didn't have the confidence to put something in that map. OK, so short term versus long term. And finally, the really nice dimension where you Danes are so nicely read, which is indulgence. So, uh, science and cocktails, whoever would invent that but Danish people? I mean, in my country, if there were drinks, there will be drinks after science, but it won't be advertised. It's sort of a bit, uh, uh, yeah, people will be slightly ashamed about having some drinks after the, uh, the talk. And in many, many other countries, there aren't any drinks at all, uh, or they might even ban music. Imagine that banning music. I mean, to a Dane, it would be inconceivable. So uh, Ireland also, very indulgent, Irish singing, Irish pubs. Uh, nobody ever heard of Irish pharmacies. No, pubs. <laughs> Whereas in France or in Russia, if you walk around there, you see pharmacies, pharmacies all around the place. Uncertainty avoiding, not indulgent, for sure people will feel that they're sick. You ask people, how are you? Oh, well, I have a little bit of a stomach ache lately. <laughs> and actually, they do that because it's an appropriate answer. It's, it's, uh, these exchanges are ways of conferring status on one another, and you do that by giving socially appropriate answers. Maybe you really feel a pain, but it, if it's not appropriate to say so, well, you won't say anything about it. Okay, so now we've seen that uh, these dimensions of culture are uh, sort of variations on the basic status power rules that I showed you in the uh, Mob Trotter Monster story. What about the culture of these trots, actually? Can you say something about it in those dimensions? It's a little test whether you uh, have understood a bit about these dimensions. So who says they are collectivistic, the trots? OK, I got quite a few votes. Who says they are individualistic? No votes. When you think about it, they do have opinions but they let the majority decide. So actually, I would say it's more egalitarian than collectivistic. But okay, it's a bit cheating eh, because I have, uh, I'm making misuse of prior knowledge. But uh, so it's not necessarily because you do the same thing that you are collectivistic. You might just freely do the same thing because you want to. And it might be egalitarianism that makes you uh, happy to subordinate yourself to a common cause. You very frequently see, especially young people, dressing the, uh, the, in the same way. Not because of collectivism, be but because of a wish to show co uh, co uh, collective identity, to show that they belong to the same group, which is not the same thing. Here, for instance, we have these four trots arguing near the entrance of the cave where Tompus just entered, whether it's a good thing that he entered or not. They argue based on arguments. Of course, I didn't tell you all that, uh, so you couldn't really know. Okay, power distance, I just told you, very, very egalitarian. And that's also why you cannot really distinguish them. How about uncertainty, uh, sorry, masculinity, would you say? Is this more of a, a fighting or a peaceful society? Who says it's more fighting? Some modest hands. Who says it's more peaceful? Yeah, I would agree with the majority. First, they trade. So, <laughs> thank you. Uh, all right, you're still wide awake. Good. Uh, they they trade. All right. So trading typically is what feminine societies are good at. Now, the Swedes are good at um, uh, uh, agriculture, for instance. You have these uh, tiny little seeds. You have to grow them, or little uh, piglets, and you have to turn them into big fat pigs. Uh, it 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 takes care. 
uh, the trots have these nuts that they have to carry. Of course, there's a monster, and that might be why you talk about fighting, but they don't know they're the monster. And the monster actually doesn't come from uh, wanting to fight, it comes from fear, anxiety. Uh, there's an undirected feeling of anxiety, and that precisely is the big bad monster of culture. Fear is a bad advisor, and that is what happens in the trots culture. Uh, they say everything changes. You remember the saying, everything changes, but the monster uh, runs eternally. So typically they are long-term oriented, but they have no control over this monster. Indulgence. Are they indulgent, these trots? I see some no. Not very, but they're not very unindulgent. They're sort of happy, huh? but maybe not as much as the Danes. Okay. So, now we go to ask some other questions of culture. We talked about the function, unwritten rules of the game, and I'm going to speed up a little bit because we don't have so much time anymore. Ontogeny, which means how does it happen to us? How do we acquire it? We acquire it when we are babies. It starts when we are little infants. So here we have this uh, little toddler uh, emulating his dad. Um, who uh, is doing something really important, obviously, because he has no longer time for his child. So the best way of claiming status for the little child is to uh, assume the same posture. Yeah. Uh, here we have a dad uh, caring for a little baby, allowing it to, uh, to touch him and feel him, which is obviously something that will make the baby uh, less afraid of powerful beings later. Here we see this, this same toddler actually uh, watching uh, a battle between older males holding a lion because you never can tell. Uh, it's, it's better to be well prepared for battle. <laughs> and here you see me proudly uh, with my two youngest daughters uh, who wanted to go uh, mountain climbing with me, uh, which is something that is a real status booster for me that they ask me and for them to be able to do that. As Dutch girls, you can do that. It's not naughty, it's good. And here we see the ultimate punishment. Be excluded from your group, from your moral circle, until you can behave again. The ultimate punishment for a child. I had four children. One of them, we had to do this. The other three, they understood before we did it, actually. <laughs> and the one was the little one. So people are different, but I, that was not the subject of my talk. Okay. So, a little lesson if you want to be a world citizen that you can draw from this theory. You should try to be a child, to be uh, curious. Children learn every day, they learn so much. From within birth to uh, when they're one year old, they have learned everything about social life. They know who's big and small, a man or a woman, more or less they can recognize. Uh, they can communicate, they can communicate lots of feelings. Uh, and this is what you don't know when you're in another country. How do I communicate that I like somebody or that I want their attention? So it's all very difficult. If you know about the status power theory, uh, it can help you decode stuff that you see in terms of conferrals and claims of status. It can help. Uh, so what is, what is uh, being tried here? And could it be that this person is actually not trying to insult me but to be nice, but does it in a different way? For instance, when you meet somebody for the first time, um, okay, uh, I have to go on. I had a little example, but I have to go on. Uh, so this can help uh, both in training and for trying at home. And the dimensions can help you reflect on that. Not everybody likes to use them, though. Well, never mind. But remi remember that your culture, the unwritten rules of the game, is not the same thing as which group do you think you belong to. That's social identity. And you saw in the little drawing video uh, in the entrance, we have all these groups to which we belong. That's social identity. It's group identity. And if we have individualistic cultures, we probably have many groups that we affiliate to to show how independent-minded we are. But it's not culture, it's identity. Evolution. I was supposed to speak about evolution of culture. So the big thing is, uh, it evolves at a time scale that's too big for most of us. You don't see it. Well, if you're a, if you're a historian or you read histor history books, The Human Web by the brothers McNeil. The Human Web. Very good book about deep history of humans. And you can see uh, things change slowly across the centuries. Basically, cultures survive, and it's survival of those cultures that can cope with their circumstances. Not the fittest, but the fit. That has happened in the past, and that's why they are still here. 
there's a need in different societies for different degrees of these uh, qualities. So if you're doing agriculture, there's some degree of endurance and obedience needed. If you're doing hunting gathering, you need initiative. And uh, those qualities will be rewarded in society. So there will be selective pressure in favor of those qualities. Uh, scarcity helps. Scarcity will probably mean that cultures are a bit harsher and probably groups will have to be more cohesive in order to uh, uh, secure the scarce resources. If you are pastoralists, then it's very easy for others to steal your cattle. They just take one cow and the whole herd will follow. So uh, you probably will have fighting cultures very ready to punish traitors to the group and to fight against invaders. So although these are not laws, they are probabilities that under certain livelihood circumstances, if you have them for centuries, you're going to have a culture that goes in a certain direction. Climate is also really important. I have a climate map here. In uh, tropical zones, uh, cultures tend to be sort of moderate on these uh, dimensions, and rather on the indulgent side. In extreme climates, you get extreme cultures, because you have to cope either with the really hot or the really cold climates. Okay, and finally, intergroup, so between group competition is a strong driver of intergroup individuality, uh, sorry, identity and also culture. You need more agreement on rules. Okay, I'll, I think I have to stop here, more or less. Uh, I can still say that the archetypes of culture are not gone. So this hunter-gatherer or pastoralist or agriculture metaphor, you can see it in prof professions that you have today. We would all like to be hunter-gatherers. So these people typically uh, like what they do. We often don't like to be the bottom class of an agricultural system. Eh? We are basically the sheep that are being herded and maybe not by a very good shepherd. Uh, so lower class. Uh, and this is really a uh, yeah, world of Warcraft, and uh, for most people it's not really agreeable. Uh, and we're getting more and more of this as our economic system soars, and we have all this economy feeding on itself, and no longer feeding in the real world. Which I think there's an urgent need for governments to reclaim. They need to reclaim public territory from uh, the world of big money. Okay. So, how can we steer change of culture? Well, you can try to manage the pressure, sort of to, uh, to train the blind beast of culture so that it learns new tricks without being able to actually control all these people. There's not a quick, uh, quick fix. And these are re really the, the boring sort of things that we have in Scandinavia, right? And we shouldn't uh, let them go. And I think with that, uh, I will have to stop talking. Thank you. <laughs>